Thank you guys. I'm really excited to be here. The baby's excited too. He's been kicking all morning. It's like, ah! <laughs> um, yeah, uh, silence. Like, like, um, like they were men everybody was mentioning, like there's so many ways to tackle this. And I, <laughs> when I was asked, I had so many ideas, like just ranging from my art um, to my life. And, um, but uh, Drew really talked to me about how this is like, could be an opportunity to be like, more vulnerable and maybe talk about things that um, you haven't before. So I decided to go with that, and we'll see how it goes. So I thought I would start with this. And this is my portrait um, from a, a collective called Carry On Homes, where they take pictures of immigrants with items they brought from home that mean something to them. And I felt it, was, it would be good to start with this picture because it tells a large part of my story in this like, very simple portrait. Um, I think the, this part of my story that is most apparent to people when they meet me. So my name is Esmeri Madi and I'm an installation artist and I moved here in 2011 from Damascus, Syria. With, and I brought those shoes with me. <laughs> but um, there is a lot more nuance to that story that um, I think is, is very difficult to capture in a simple, like, hi, I'm Esma, I'm from Syria, uh, or even for a portrait to catch. And, um, and that's because my story actually started here in Minnesota. Um, my parents met in McAllister. Um, here they are <laughs> graduating from their undergrad, way too young to have kids, but they <laughs> carried me up to the stage. And, um, and they continued to live here in the United States for six, about seven years. And so we ended up not going back to Syria until I was, I mean, I'm almost seven, so an adult, no. Um, and we crossed, so we crossed the Mediterranean back to Syria. This is not us crossing the Mediterranean, just us in the Mediterranean. <laughs> I'm, I'm the older one. Um, and, uh, and even though my father is Syrian, for some reason he never spoke any Arabic to me. And so moving back to Syria was this very strange experience of me, this, I'm told I was this Syrian kid, but suddenly in this completely new environment where I couldn't even speak the language. And as what happens when seven year olds are registered in school and, uh, Suddenly, I was surrounded not only by what felt like a completely new and f scary <laughs> environment, but also a language that I couldn't make heads or tails of. And uh, here's me in school. I, I put a little arrow so you can find me. <laughs> um, and this was really my first lesson in silence. And it, um, it was a lesson like born in the fire of being a kid, feeling overwhelmed by a culture I felt that I didn't belong in. And, um, with this really big problem of every time I open my mouth, like kids would laugh at me. And I think at least a few people in here know how cruel seven-year-olds can be. I mean, they're very cute, but they can be pretty mean. And so silence kind of became my thing. It was my shtick. It was my uh, it was my armor. It um, it was my first the first thing I used to like navigate this really new environment and take in the language and kind of try to catch up. But also, it wasn't just about like a silence of words, because I did suddenly go very quiet for a very long time. But I also felt like I needed to silence other parts of myself as well. I had this just overwhelming feeling of foreignness. And as an adult now, with retrospect and um, maturity, um, I, I realized that that wasn't necessarily because I was born in America and now I was in Syria or anything like that. It's just a feeling that many people um, have growing up. Um, it's a sense of feeling not like they're not really in the right place or they're not moving right or they're not talking right or their ideas are kind of maybe not super kosher. So, I, I really learned how to silence myself. And, and being also in this, in a, growing up in a family with different cultures and uh, religious backgrounds, um, I also started to get this impression that words not only were dangerous because they expose who you are, but they can also be used as these weapons to hurt people. And um, I just, I just re really felt that, uh, 
I had to think and rethink everything that came out of my mouth, just to the, like, the edge of obsession. And, and again, like I said, it kind of became my thing. And so that's why when I discovered our masterpiece, um, it was this, just this amazing, profound moment of finding a language that I could feel safe in, and a space where I could speak without feeling um, so exposed and so vulnerable. And it, it kind of also became my language. Um, if, if, I, if I liked somebody, I made them art. If I wanted to be friends with someone, I made them art. Um, and uh, this kind of went on for quite some time, um, both the, the tower of silence and um, me kind of seeking this refuge in art. But, but even as a teenager, I was known to be this, like, like many teenager rebellions were like marked by slam doors and like loud <laughs> cuss words. Or, and, but mine was like, I suppose, was known that like when she was mad at you, she just would stop talking to you. I, I once fought with a member of my family and didn't talk to them for like a year. This is a very close, I'm not going to say who, but like in the immediate family. <laughs> um, and once I reached 12th grade, I kind of did my ultimate feat in this self-silencing that I was kind of going through. And in, in Syria, Damascus, um, when you finish your high school and you sign up for college, you, don't, you have to predetermine your, um, what your major is going to be. And I was this girl who loved art and was not a big fan of um, the sciences, um, but nice Syrian girls didn't study art. Um, and so I registered in chemistry. Um, and I think this is one of my second biggest lessons in silence and, the, and in the limitations of how far you can go to kind of silence yourself in the face, the overwhelming evidence of who you are. And three years into this utter struggle with just, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be a chemist, um, just, there was just too many cracks in my tower. And uh, I came to this space where I was either going to just forget about this whole college situation, or I was going to have to make a different choice. And that's when I registered in art. And uh, as you probably can imagine, it was just, of course, life transforming. It, it was the first, my first step in like finding my voice once again um, and, 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 and speaking my truth. So I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit, just two years, to 2011, and I'm two years into studying art. And uh, at this time, another breaking of silence was happening around me. And uh, this was the breaking of silence of people in my country towards decades at that point of silence in the face of terrible injustice and, and pain and suffering um, on all, in all aspects of life. And uh, kind of keeping with what I had learned about the danger of words and the danger of breaking your silence, um, the backlash to their breaking of silence was beyond what my worst nightmares could have conjured up. Uh, what my worst anxieties as a kid could imagine would be the retribution to speaking. But even though that, the response was so intense, I, what really stuck with me was not that, but rather the courage of these people that continued to speak their truth despite facing more than I could ever, ever have. Um, imagined or have faced myself in my biggest fears of being known. 2011 was also the year that I found, that me and my husband found ourselves um, having to move out of Damascus. And we moved in a strange homecoming back here to Minnesota. Um, and I once again, <laughs> moving back here, felt like that little girl. I mean, this time I spoke the language, um, but I, I once again felt this out of space, strange foreignness, this, this uh, feeling of not being sure that how I, who I was was right for where I am. And, um, but this time, behind me and around me was the courage and resilience of my friends and family who I was hearing incredible 
intense stories from every day. And it was almost impossible to retreat back completely into that like tower of, of silence and uh, silencing. And so I, I started experiment with, experimenting with going further with breaking my long-held silence. Um, I made loud work about issues that had troubled me for a very long time in both S Syria and America, um, issues about violence against women, um, uh, the, the violence that was currently happening in my hometown. And, <laughs> and while I was putting together this presentation, I kind of was like, ah, oh, I want to end here. I want to be like, and then I lived courageously ever after. And everything was great. <laughs> everything went fine. Breaking your silence is great. Um, but life is not this like simple trajectory towards progress. Um, at least it's never been that way for me. It's always been these hills and valleys. And, uh, and I think also when you've maintained your silence for so long, people come to expect that from you. And they get kind of, mm, when you, you start speaking up. And yeah, I, the backlash was pretty intense. I, I got messages from family members um, telling me feminism had addled my brain um, and uh, that somehow speaking towards um, certain issues that were so important to me, like uh, violence against women and certain issues, was somehow encouraging or giving ammunition to racists who, who, who stereotype people from where I come from. Um, I got uh, texts from people who had always been my friends uh, telling me these are not things we speak about. Um, I, I talked about uh, sexual abuses in uh, religious communities and I was told that I, I, was, I was furthering the pain for the victims. <sighs> I was told that I was hurting my mother, my father, destroying my reputation, whatever, I mean. <laughs> um, and, and, that was just, and that was just like the social media stuff. So um, as I, and, but I mean, you know, there's some d devils or g genies that you can't stick back in the bottle, right? So um, even with that, like I had taken that step, like I, it was is a choice that I had clearly made, and um, and even though sometimes I got back under that safety blanket of silence, like it, it just would keep like coming out of me, and 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 it started to come out in my work, which became a lot louder and and more authentic to really what I wanted to talk about and what the issues that I wanted to address were, and I. And it was, on one hand, it was really great because when you're like you're true and authentic, and you speak in your true voice and you speak your truth, you find other people who really identify really deeply with that and you're able to have deeper conversations. And I got this amazing opportunity to actually show here at the MIA uh, for the MAEP show, which was amazing. And I got featured in Hyperallergic, which was also amazing. But again, like this is another place I kind of want to stop, but, <laughs> um, but that, those really amazing moments in my career seem to always be coupled with this almost these attempts at silencing that I, my, my uh, f uh, flight or fright part of my brain always expected anyway. And uh, I, f I found that like living in this world today is like a Syrian American woman, there's something about my presence in spaces that's just inherently political and, div and divisive and uh, wh wh whatever I'm talking about honestly. And uh, there was a lot of backlash to those moments of um, success. And I, <laughs> I went back to some of the comments on like, some of the hyperallergic stuff and the Mia stuff. And actually, I didn't find some of the worst comments. I think maybe they were like, I don't know, maybe Russian trolls, and they took down their accounts. But like, I found some of them. <laughs> and honestly, like, uh, I, I wanted to get you guys more comments, like have this Think, but like honestly, like ten minutes into like screenshotting, I was like, oh my god, my stomach hurts. No, <laughs> so. <laughs> but the, the back, I mean, the backlash was there, and I and I want to say that I got thick skin, and um, that was it. And I made my authentic work, and I spoke my truth. But again, like it, it, it it's hills and valleys, and. Uh, 
I, I retreat into my silence all the time, and like a child hiding under her covers, and, and stop talking, and get off social media, and hide from my friends, and only talk to my family, like, with what, like, just the bare minimum. Well, I mean, I'm a mom, so the bare minimum is sometimes a lot, but, um, <laughs> um, but I cannot help but feel every time that I go through these fear, trauma spaces of being afraid of being who I am and speaking my truth and breaking my silence, I can't help but look around the world and see these movements that have broken their silence despite unbelievable consequences. My, be it my hometown, Syria, be it all the other places around the world that break their silence despite immeasurable odds of, of being shot and killed and having everything taken away. Uh, the Me Too movement, women speaking up and then having their reputation like pulled through the mud for speak instead of that, the, how it should be with the, like, the perpetrator having being scrutinized. Um, and I can't help but come away from these things again feeling this sense that like well silence it can feel safe um, speaking your truth and and uh, and breaking your silence sometimes is it's is is courageous and 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 it's important and i i, I even though I can't give you this perfect trajectory towards um, success for you, what I can say, and I, when I, uh, and I was thinking about how to end this, and I was just thinking that, you know what, like, I'm here, I'm today, here today, and I'm talking to you guys in front of a camera, this is literally one of my phobias, and, <laughs> and, I, and I think I would call that progress. So, thank you guys, don't let anybody silence your truths. All right, we have some time for a little bit of Q&A. And I'm going to throw one question out first. Okay, go for it. What's this? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I kind of, I, I, I really wanted, I know this is limited time, and I wanted to walk through my story. And first starting with like these pictures of myself and then moving to like pictures of my work. And so this is my latest piece. And it kind of felt like this, like, you know, this opened up dome of silence. So I was like, yeah. This will this will <laughs> work. It, so this is my latest piece in the Rochester uh, Art Center. It's uh, it's um, it's a projection. That's a projection, and when you walk through it, it breaks apart, kind of like from the presence of the person within it. Yeah. Uh, we have mics on the side, so raise your hand if you have a question. We'll get you a mic. Probably, yeah. What was the last piece of all the pictures of the children? Yeah, so this was the piece that I had at the, oh, no, not that one. So, <laughs> so this is a piece, part of the show at the MAEP. Oh, this is great, because I didn't, I felt like I maybe didn't have time to talk about all my work, so yeah, ask me questions about my work. <laughs> so um, uh, this was my, part of my piece for the MAEP, and um, I had recently become a mom, and I really wanted to, and I was really thinking a lot about like identity forming for children, like for Syrian children who had to incorporate a lot of trauma, or, or at least difficult topics, into like who they were, because it, it was a literal part of how they got here, where they were in the world. And so what I did is I, I went to different places around the world and talked to some of my friends who were refugees and um, immigrants and then found out that I was a lot more interested in what their kids had to say. And so I interviewed all these children and it was part of the show um, uh, Thicker Than Water that was here at the MAP. And w part of it was this huge projection on the wall of uh, 16 kids just talking. Is your family still in Syria? Uh, so a part of my family is, and a part of them are here. So um, my, gr my grandma is, and grandfather and aunt, and some of my cousins are there. Um, my, <laughs> my grandma is amazing. She sends us these daily emails um, with news about, <laughs> news about her cats and what they ate for lunch. <laughs> and <laughs> through 
anything. Like, sometimes there'll be a footnote like, oh, we, there was a lot of shooting here at the house today. <laughs> but it's mostly about the cats, <laughs> genuinely. Like, like oh, sometimes the work like, sneaks in there, like I had to go through many checkpoints today to take the cat to the vet, but <laughs> um, they're just, and, and they're these daily affirmations of, of like these like, call us, like we're here, we're, we're doing good, we love you, we miss you. So some of the irony of finding our voice happens when other people are finding a way to put us down, so they're also finding their voice at the same time. What is some of the work that you do to fight critics and ensure that your voice in yourself is louder than their words? Yeah, that's an amazing question. I, I really like that because now I have to like, figure out what, what I do. Um, well, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so actually I do a lot of like positive silence like they were talking about um, previously a lot of sitting with myself and getting to know the voices in my head because I, I think critics w w or are most or trolls or whatever they're they're most they work best, okay, they silence us the most when they're matching those hidden voices in our head, when they're echoing them. And, and when you know, when you have that self-awareness, what you can do is, is you counteract the voice in your head first. And then so when somebody else comes and is doing like what feels like, oh no, they're affirming what I suspected all along, I'm a fraud, ah. You've done that work with like, kind of like talking, okay, this is a feeling everybody has, like, they're, there's, here's a list that I've made of why it's not true. So yeah, I think m the best work or the most successful work I've done is actually working on my own self-critic and my own silencing voices. Um, yeah. I was really struck by what you said about using art as a language, um, like gifting art to people when you want to be friends with them. But I also feel like, even for me, I use art as a language with myself to kind of figure out who I am internally um, as well. And I'm curious about kind of your perspective on that given the feelings of, you know, being an immigrant and not feeling fully accepted in either place. Yeah. Um yeah, definitely. So I, I talk a lot when I when I make work and people are like, oh, so why did you pick this topic? I talk a lot about externalizing overwhelming feelings. And so, again, like, actually, me too, I'm on the same boat. Like, when, when I'm making work, it's generally, for me, it's generally for processing feelings that I have that I feel like I, A, don't have the words to, to express how complicated and, and difficult they feel, and B, they're so big, the feelings are so big, and the thoughts are so sharp edge that I need to take them out of me and make them an externalized object so that I can look at them and feel, okay, a little separated and then more able to process. What are you working on now? What's coming up for you? <laughs> well, this first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just finished this show at the Rochester, it was a huge endeavor, it had a lot of um, technology which uh, anybody who's worked with technology knows just the nightmare, um, especially the nightmare when it's like an hour and a half away every time I need to fix a burned out projector. But um, so I actually just, just finished this, it's super fresh and um, I, in 2018 was the first time I went back to Syria since I left in 2011. So a lot of the work I'm thinking about right now is about that trip um, that I took and being home for the fir home for the first time in many many years in a very surreal kind of um, homecoming where it was almost like somebody built a replica of what used to be a place that I knew. Thank you. I um, I, have, I was wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about hi, hi sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, the. I'm curious of the difference between your two 
uh, kind of mediums. Um, this, which has a clearly a bunch of different voices and is breaking the silence, and um, and and your other work that we saw earlier in in, in the PowerPoint of um, the cut stone with the paint on top, and yeah, that one and. Uh, that really intrigues me, the difference between the two and your expression as an artist of the, the actual expression of, of different concepts and feelings through a silent piece of work versus this other, which has uh, clearly a lot of the opposite of silence, a lot of different voices in, in the vernacular of the, in the purest form of the children. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and thank you, and I'd like to compliment you on, on, uh, on your story. It's very, it, so it's much. fascinating. Um, yeah, thanks for that question too. I always like to talk about my work. So um, it, it's hard to it's hard to talk about my work without making the whole presentation about it. So I had to like pick and choose and like with the photos. So this is the photo when I like talked about how I was talking about like violence towards women, and um, it does look like a very still two objects. But in actuality, I, so I call myself an installation artist because I I like to combine like video and silent objects. Um, sometimes silent video too, but um, so th th what this was, this was um, in reaction to a video that kind of went uh, viral on my feed of a, of a woman in Syria being killed because she, she was said that she had committed adultery. So, it, and it was just, it was just this really intense, horrifying film and what I ended up doing is I, uh, I brought, took the whole film put it in Photoshop and went through it like second by second. Less, I, you, people who know video know like what the actual, um, I can't think of it right now. But And I actually with the eraser in Photoshop erased everybody around her and just kept her presence in there. And I showed that silent video of just this woman, you can't really tell what's happening, dancing around the stage uh, alongside what I felt would be like uh, uh, this uh, holy relics of her. And so this woman who kind of symbolized for some certain people this like uh, this uh, dirtiness or deviance whatever um, for me I wanted to take those particular elements as being the most beautiful and holy parts of her so the she was killed with a rock so the gold leaf was her blood and her hair, like everybody was mad at her because her hair was showing. So like her hair were these prayer beads. So yeah, so it's hard to like tell the whole story of like what the work is saying in this presentation. So that's why I love these questions. Um, but yeah, so most of my work like is this kind of combination of like object and film. So like with the children's um, projection, it was also accompanied by 16 objects that spoke to the like the anxieties of parental children Conversations, identity forming, being a, what would it means to be like a refugee or an immigrant in this time? Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a question about your practice. It, with someone's a, someone's a painter or a potter, like they can go into the studio every day and they can kind of develop this routine that might facilitate their work. Do you have something that you do that's similar that that keeps your work in the everyday? Yeah, no, and I need to though. But <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a lot. Well, so one of but no, and I need to. But I also have some things that I do to kind of keep myself moving forward. And one of the things is that I do is that I I make it a, a like a like a, a thing that like, a, like a, a ritual that once a week, at least once a week, I have to apply to one online something. Show, grant, oh my gosh, all kinds of random things I've applied to. And, and with that urgency in mind, I'm always trying to, like, it keeps me, like, it keeps me accountable, and it keeps me making even, like, through hard times. So, yeah, thanks. Okay. One more. Oh, one more. Yeah, let's do one. Okay. Hi. Um, just following from uh, the question about your practice and also remembering your work in the MAEP gallery, many of the pieces involved found objects. Yeah. And I wondered if you start from a position of having an idea and then look for a means to articulate that, or do you find that the found objects start sort of resonating or speaking for you, and out of that you 
understand what it is you're trying to work with? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, both, but mostly, uh, so with that show particularly, I, I usually start with the idea. Because I, because I was had all these like interviews in mind, and, and, I, and there was these very, very clear threads that I really wanted to speak to. So with most of them, like I would be like, okay, so I've talked to like 10 children now, all of them have talked, for example, about this, um, uh, oh my gosh, there were so many, but like, for example, this, this uh, uh, fear of, uh, of, of holding on to who they are in places that um, are new and different and holding on to the tradition. So I really want to make something about that. Okay, so what are some of the objects the kids talked about with that and the parents? And then, okay, so um, maybe I could ask them for a book or something and then I could adjust that to kind of speak towards this idea. Um, but um, with some of um, uh, with some other work, like for example, this, like I found myself really fascinated with um, uh, with uh, the roofs and mosques and thinking about um, sacred space and what what kind of designated that and what designated like um, what 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 it what it meant to go into that space and being a person presence in it and um, so I, I so. And, and I was obsessed with geodesic domes, so I had a geo, so I made a geodesic dome first, and then I was like, okay, what is this about? And, then, <laughs> and so, um, and then I brought this first obsession as a second obsession, and it became uh, a piece. Yeah, so so a little bit of both. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys.